Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So a little bit of housekeeping, first of all. Um, make sure that you take this moment to silence your cell phones. Where's moment? Here it is. Silence your cell phones, your watches, your computers. Um, if you brought small children with you, silence them too. Uh, you don't want to be getting uh, any unwanted attention. So let's uh, make sure you've silenced everything. Take that opportunity right now. If you have any questions, um, I've got a lot to cover. So just make note of your questions. We'll have some time at the end to, to talk about those. We're going to be recording these sessions as we always do, and the other, all the other sessions as well. And if you're going to be posting on social media, which I very much encourage you to do, use the hashtag XDC2023. So our MVPs, they really do a terrific job giving us their feedback and uh, that is of the community as well. And uh, I'd just like to thank them for the job that they're doing. Uh, Anthony, Christian, Jeremy, Kim, Martin, and Wayne. And three of them are here today, Christian, Jeremy, and Martin. So make sure you take a moment to meet them. So the Zojo team is here as well. And for us, getting together with all of you in person is really one of the biggest benefits of coming to events like this. So feel free to introduce yourself to all of us and uh, ask questions. If you want to schedule some one-on-one -on -one time with any of us, talk to Dane and Alyssa about that. And of course, we're really excited to be doing our first official event here in Europe. That's really great. Uh, this is my third time to England, and it's always a pleasure to come. So we've got 20 sessions, a full day of sessions today, tomorrow, and Friday. And we've got a couple of evening events, which should be a lot of fun. It gives us a lot of time to talk to all of you, which is one of the reasons we do these things. And we've got an XDC app once again. Um, one of our MVPs, Martin Trippensey, decided that he wanted to exercise the Android framework. So he suggested that he build a new XDC app, and so he's done that. Uh, looks really great. And uh, Jeremy Leroy, one of our other MVPs, decided that he was going to build an iOS equivalent. So he got the Android project and built the iOS version of that. It looks really great. So you can download these uh, if you just search for XDC 2023 in the Google Play Store or the uh, iOS App Store. They're both available. Uh, Jeremy and Martin put a lot of work into these. They did a really great job. So give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so since we last met, you know, our, our conferences are typically about a year apart, uh, a little different this time. It's only been just seven short months since our conference in Nashville. And since then, we've had three major releases. We've had four minor releases. We've added 65 new features and fixed 419 bugs during that time. And believe it or not, 127 of those were in the web framework alone. Uh, Ricardo's been doing a fantastic job making the web framework uh, better, more robust. I don't know how he does it either. He lives in the Canary Islands. And if I lived in the Canary Islands, I'm not sure I'd be in front of my computer ever. Uh, but he's doing a great job. All right, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we've made 216 documentation changes as well over the last seven months. So as I mentioned in our last conference, we're continuing to incorporate the bug bash into each release cycle. So for two weeks per cycle, we spend time looking for the types of issues that we would normally address in a bug bash. These are things that are um, not necessarily a high priority for the community overall, but they're a high priority for a small group of individuals, maybe even just a single person. So for example, if you look in the issue system at the 2023 R2 milestone, our next one, there are already 17 issues that have been resolved uh, that are the type of bug that we would you notice the top one's from Christian, 
and it was actually created 12 years ago. So we finally got around to that one, yeah. yeah. So if you have an item that's a priority for you, you want to press the, uh, the, up, you know, the thumbs up button, because that's our way of knowing that this is a priority. Um, even if it's not a priority for a lot of people, when we go looking for these types of issues to fix, we're going to be looking for the ones that have a thumbs up. So don't just enter the bug into the system. Make sure you press the thumbs up button as well. Now, a few things we've improved. We improved the code editor syntax help. Uh, this is one of my favorite improvements we've made, honestly, over the last uh, seven months. Being able to see all of the, uh, the method signatures in the code area syntax, that's, it saves me a lot of you know, trips to the uh, documentation, which is really, really great. Because often, you know, I know the method I want to use. I just can't remember what the third parameter is. <laughs> so that's been really great. And Javier has been hard at work on the PDF uh, support in Zojo. Uh, there's way too many improvements to mention. We'd be here all day. So, uh, but PDF has really come a long way, which is really great. And, and that's based on your, on your request. So, yeah. Now, as you know, we write Zojo in Zojo. So, you know, we're users just like you are. And uh, as you can imagine, the Zojo IDE project is very, very large. And it takes a long time to load into Zojo. So we did some optimization over the last seven months, and now the IDE project loads at twice the speed as it did before. So those of you that have large projects, both for desktop and web, uh, will appreciate that. We've put all the examples online now. It used to be that they shipped with the download, you know, with the product. And that meant that if we wanted to fix a bug in one, we wanted to add new ones, it meant waiting for the next release. Well, now they're all online. These are all being delivered over the internet. So we can change them at any time between releases, et cetera, which is really great. We can add new ones. We can fix bugs if we find one in an existing uh, example, which has been really great. We're now supporting Linux on ARM64. Um, now that Raspberry Pi is, has been updated to 64-bit, you can run 64-bit apps on Pi 3 or higher. And at this point, all the cloud ARM servers are running Linux 64, so uh, that's great for that as well. And you know, when we brought the, uh, the web framework, we, we had a, a chart control. And a lot of people that use the web framework said, wow, I'd really like to have that chart control for the desktop and for mobile, so we did that. Javier uh, rewrote the chart control from scratch. This is all written in pure Zojo code, so if you've used it, that's what it is. It's not an HTML view or anything. We have it for mobile as well, which is really great. 100% Zojo code. And this is another thing that, it's hard to believe that, that we didn't have this the whole time, but in the debugger, we've now got a filter um, for those of you that have lots and lots of properties and variables and you're having to scan through this long list of, of them to find what you're looking for, it's so nice now to be able to just type in a few characters and see what matches. Uh, that's a real, real time saver. So if, if, you're, if you haven't used this feature, make sure you go try it out because it really saves quite a bit of time. And of course, there's been 58 other smaller but still important features that we've added over the last seven months. And many of these are direct, uh, the result of direct input from all of you. So make sure that you utilize our uh, issues feature to enter your bug reports and feature requests. Now, all of this has been over the last seven months, but we've still been hard at work on Android and other you know, projects we have bubbling away in the Zojo laboratories. Um, which brings me to what I want to talk about today, and that is change. So at Zojo, we embrace change. Change is what drives progress. It's what makes things go forward. And change happens whether we like it or not. Right? So we need to embrace it to keep up with an ever-changing world. For example, when we started way back when, we only supported building desktop apps. And yet now, we support building apps for the console, web, and mobile as well. When we started, we only supported Mac OS. Today, we support Mac OS, Windows, Linux, and iOS. And coming soon, Android. 
When we started, we originally only supported the 68K and PowerPC, PowerPC processors, which, boy, that seems like a long time ago, right? <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, you've, I've just dated myself. OK. Um, today, it's x86 and ARM. Now, originally, our documentation was printed documentation. How many of you remember having spiral bound? Yeah, OK. So um, these were great for you know, working out. You lift them and all that stuff, yeah. But uh, over a decade ago, we went to online documentation. Now. This was a great system initially. It wasn't quite the aesthetics that we wanted, so we now have an improved system. And um, it takes some time to adjust to a new system, but I think it's really great. It's a big upgrade from the old one. We used to ship on CD, right? This is a blast from the past. It's hard to believe that we used to get CDs out. And we used to ship a box in a retail store, right? So a lot has changed. This was our original user interface, All right? Looks pretty ancient now. And this version was all written in C++, right? So, of course, things have changed a little bit. We rewrote Zojo in Zojo itself. And that the term for that is dog fooding. And it's really, really important. Um, I felt like back then, and this was a long time ago, but I felt like we weren't as sympathetic to all of you as users, because we weren't users. We wrote in C++, not in Zojo, right? So by rewriting the IDE in Zojo, we became Zojo users. And there, I could see a dramatic shift, uh, because when you guys would report an issue or you had a feature, we'd be like, wow, yeah, we, we'd really like to have that too. We, we need to get to work on that. So it's really important to do dog fooding. Now, we used to localize Zojo into French, German, Italian, Japanese, and Spanish. But what we found over the years is that those of you that speak uh, English as a second language were using the English version. <laughs> you weren't using these localized versions. So now we ship just in English. Originally, the Zojo compiler was two single pass compilers, really one for Windows and one for Mac. Um, we then rewrote our compiler from scratch to have a modern front end and back end. This is how compilers are typically architected. And over time, we eventually swapped out our back ends for LLVM. LLVM became a mature uh, compiler back end. We looked at this early on, and it wasn't quite mature enough, but eventually, over time, as projects get worked on, it became better and better and better, and we swapped it out which has been great, because that's a part of the, of the uh, tool chain that we don't have to maintain. And LVM is an optimizing compiler. There's a lot of benefits to it. Now, with version one of our web framework, being able to build sophisticated uh, web applications without learning the alphabet soup of web technologies was really revolutionary. Uh, but the web kept moving. It kept changing. So we needed to change with it, and we built, we built Web 2. Now, I realize that for some of you with Web 1 apps, the idea of transitioning to Web 2 was daunting. And honestly, if we could rewind the clock, we would probably do it a little bit differently to make that, prog that process more smooth. Nevertheless, Web 2 provides a lot of great benefits. Um, it's very robust, uh, better performance, et cetera. And Dave Cox is doing a session uh, transitioning from Web 1 to Web 2. So if you have some Web 1 projects, you want to check that out. That's going to be on Friday. <clears throat> now, over the first 20 years, um, our API over time became inconsistent. That's another change that we've made. And part of that was you know, us not being quite as careful as we probably should have been in designing APIs. But most of it was just the result of changing technologies. Um, in 1998, we couldn't have anticipated building web apps, for example, or building mobile apps, for that matter. So as technology changes, APIs have to change. And we created API2. Now, this caused a little consternation and some effort on your part. 
Um, and we, we'd absolutely appreciate that. But the API that we ended up with is far more intuitive and, and uh, consistent, code's more readable, and we have solid guidelines now uh, to make sure that the APIs stay consistent in the future. We've had several bug tracking features uh, over the years. You know, in the past, that wasn't a big enough area, I guess, for there to be commercial products. So initially, our bug tracking was done via our mailing list, email list, right? Way, way back. Then we built our own application, which we call RealBugs. Um, then we decided, OK, now there are commercial products available. Let's switch to a commercial product. So we went with a product called FogBugs. The problem with that is, most software developers are lucky to get bug reports at all, right? Uh, their users don't want to search their bug base. <laughs> well, you guys aren't the typical developers, right? So um, you want to be able to search our bug base, see if things have been reported, see if features have been requested. So we built the feedback app for that purpose because there wasn't anything commercially available. But now there is. Uh, this is GitLab's issues. As you probably know, we've transitioned to that. And it's really great. It does everything we need, and it's a system that we do not have to maintain. So we're very, very happy with it, uh, with issues. So all of these changes were a step forward. Uh, most of them are the result of a lot of hard work on our part. Um, and the goal of that is to make things as effortless as we can for you. Um, now, sometimes that requires some work from you as well, but it's the reason that we've been around as long as we have, because we've been willing to adapt and change. And some changes have been really positive. Uh, for example, in quarter one of this year, our renewals are up 10% over the same quarter last year. That's been great. And uh, new license sales are up 20%, so we're seeing a lot of new users coming to the real, to, to, sorry, the real, I was about to say real basic, to the Sojo community. And you know, programming languages, of course, change. In fact, uh, the Register recently did an article in, in, this, in March about BASIC uh, that is still around in modern forms. And they did a couple of paragraphs about Zojo. Uh, their sort of sub-headline was, BASIC is anything but dead, which was great to hear. Um, BASIC has changed, though, itself quite a bit. Uh, if you recognize this, that's AppleSoft BASIC. That was the BASIC I used initially. And it's changed to a, what, what our contribution to the modern equivalent, of course. Uh, wait a minute, let me switch to dark mode. There we go. OK. <laughs> so um, Zojo isn't really BASIC, but it has its roots in BASIC in the idea that a programming language can be intuitive and easy to use, but still powerful. Uh, I don't think you need to make that trade-off. It's a lot of hard work to not make that trade-off. And I'm not talking about just in Zojo and in our uh, tools, but in all the software that you develop. Right? If you just have the mindset that I'm going to make this easy and intuitive, but also powerful, that can be accomplished. It just takes a lot more work. But the end result is something far, far better uh, for your users. So I really encourage you to just make that extra effort to get there. And as a side note, I'm a big fan of the show Futurama. And there's a lot of Easter eggs in Futurama. And this is one of them where Fry and Bender are sharing an apartment. And Fry just walks past this, painting, this, this picture on the wall. Right? And it's, of course, some pseudo basic code. Uh, I think the first program I ever wrote was an endless loop like this, right? just printing something over and over and over again. So in our ever-changing world, um, one of the things that's changing is in-person events like this one. Uh, they really are, unfortunately, becoming a thing of the past. Apple, Google, and others have all gone to essentially in-person events, especially for developer conferences. And I want to talk about why that is. Well, first of all, we all remember this, <laughs> the pandemic. Uh, that really forced a lot of events to go online. And I think a lot of people found that um, an in -per or a, a online event wasn't as bad as they expected it to be, um, and it didn't require taking your shoes off at the airport, <laughs> which was nice. Um, so that, that's been occurring. We're in an increasingly on-demand world. 
right? Um, the other day, I was standing in my house and realized I needed a new power strip. And I could have gotten my car and driven five minutes down to a retail store to buy one. But instead, I pulled my phone out. I pressed a button, ordered one from Amazon. It showed up the next day. You know, that's the world that we're living in now, this increasingly on-demand world. Um, we had an uh, introduction to programming in Zojar w webinar recently, and we had 200 people register for an online event. So, um, and if you look around here, we have about half the crowd that we've had in the past. So people just aren't going to online events the way they used to. But we're going to make all of the XTC videos this year free to everybody. We want to have as much online content as we can. We're going to be making more videos, we're doing more webinars. We're, we're seeing an increasing demand for that. I mean, we, there's always been demand, but there's even more demand for it now. So we're going to keep doing that. Now, this is also why we're not planning for an XTC event in 2024. Um, we like getting together in person, so we're still going to do meetups whenever and wherever we can. Uh, so be looking out for that. We'll announce them in the uh, newsletter, so make sure you're subscribed to the newsletter. I'm sure we'll post them on the forum and places like that. So we will have those. Um, and if you want to have events, you know, please let us know, because we, we like doing this, this sort of thing in person. But the sort of traditional developer conference is unfortunately just becoming like a CD. Right? It's, a, it's a thing of the past. So let's talk about the future. Um, things continue to change, of course. Change is inevitable. We have to adapt. Uh, we have to be willing to change. I, I think it's one of the reasons uh, that Zojo has been around for so long, is our willingness to change. I mean, if you look at what I showed you earlier, um, it, it's the version that we originally shipped in 1998 is unrecognizable today. Right? Every, nearly everything we've done has changed. It's almost an entirely different product, but sort of like evolution, it's been this incremental change over time. And you don't really notice it until you step back and look at the whole thing and think, wow, it really has changed quite a bit. So what does the future hold? Well, since the last conference was only seven months ago, uh, let's look at a few items from our roadmap that have had some significant development during that time. So one of our roadmap items is to have a modern UI for Windows, specifically Windows 10 and 11. Uh, Microsoft has done a lot on their user interface to update controls. And we're going to be delivering the first milestone of that quite soon using uh, a new control called the Desktop XAML Container. This is going to be your first opportunity to start using these modern controls in uh, Windows applications. And this is just a few of them. There are actually a lot more. Uh, than this, but these are the modern looking controls for Windows. And uh, William's going to be doing a session on this later today. This will be the first deliverable milestone. Initially, it's going to be a, a control you use and then pick what you want inside that control. But this is the foundation for what will be our modern uh, Windows UI controls, the ones that you normally use from the library. So today, you're getting Win32 controls when you drag out a button in a text field and things like that. Um, you can start using these new controls with the desktop XAML container, uh, but in the future, you'll be, these will just replace the, the existing uh, Win32 controls with new modern Windows controls. Another, uh, whoops, we skipped back there a bit. Here, let me go back. Okay, so we've been working on the popover control. You can see it here for uh, Mac and iOS. We're looking into how to do this for Windows, Linux, web, and Android as well. So this is a new control. It's essentially a dialog, right? You can put the controls you want in this and in this uh, dialog pop over and show it wherever you want. Um, I got a quick little video here. You can kind of see how it works in action. You can control where it, if it pops left, right. You can make it detachable if you want. You can see he's setting it to pop left or right. And it's intelligent, too. Um, you'll see in a second he's going to move the, the uh, window. Yeah, so that's a popover. And of course, we've been making great progress 
on Android if you've, been, if you've been testing out the Android test builds that we've been providing. In fact, at this point, we've had, since we started providing test builds, we've had 982 issues reported against Android. And of those 982, we've resolved 947 of them, which is really great. That is 96% of those that have been reported. So we're getting down to the wire here. There's, there's just a handful of things left, at least so far. I'm sure you guys will report even more <laughs> in the future. And as you saw before, we've, um, there we go. We built the uh, Android app, or Martin built the Android uh, app for XDC. So it's come a long way, the fact that he could, he could build an app this sophisticated. So when is it shipping? I know that's what you're thinking. We've been talking about Android for a while now. When is it shipping? Well, we don't comment on when things are going to ship until we're really confident that we know they will ship in a certain release. And that's why I can say at this point that we're going to be shipping Android finally in 2023 R2. That's our next release. It's come a long, long way. OK, so this is going to be marked as beta. Um, we do this when we have a really big feature like this. Uh, if you remember when we switched our Mac framework from Carbon to Cocoa, we marked it as beta for a release. Um, it, we've already got lots of apps in the app stores and things. People have been doing that. So it, it's getting really mature, but it'll be marked as beta. And um, if you have an iOS, a Pro or a Pro Plus license, then you're going to be getting Android support for free. It's included at no additional charge. Uh, if, you have a or if you have an iOS license, rather, then that's going to become a mobile license. It means you have iOS and Android. So the, the iOS license is now going to be a mobile license. It includes both support for iOS and Android. Now, initially, you'll create a separate Android project. That's how it'll initially work. Uh, there are just some differences between iOS and Android uh, in terms of how controls lock to the screens, um, things like uh, the, the table control. So we have some changes uh, that need to come before we can make it a single project. But that is our goal. Just like the desktop, our goal is to have a single mobile project so that you can build a single project and, and then just compile for Android and iOS, um, just like you do for the desktop. And more. You know, now that we're getting uh, to the point where we'll be able to look into the rearview mirror and see Android in the past, you know, we'll shipped it, um, that's going to free up a lot of time for us to do other things. So let's look at a few of those. So, this is, Zojo Libraries is something we used to call it plugins, but it's the same concept, and we've talked about this before. It's basically the ability for you to take some portion of a Zojo project and compile it to a uh, library that you can then distribute, you know, use it in your other projects, um, sell if you want to sell it, give it away for free, that, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it's great for if you want to commercialize something. If you just want to have a, a level of sort of version control within projects that share code. Uh, Zojo libraries are great for that, right? But the thing about uh, using external objects is that um, the moment you update it in one project, it's immediately updated in, other, in the other projects you're sharing. And that can be good, and that can be not so good. So it just depends on what you're doing. But with a Zojo library, what you're dropping into your, new, your other project is compiled code. It's not going to change until you compile a new version and, and drop it in. So that's the advantage of Zojo libraries. And better database connectivity. We'll be starting that initially with a new control, the database connection class. Um, a lot of work has already been done on both of these items, both Zojo libraries and the database connection class. So we're working hard on that. And something that's not on the roadmap that we're definitely thinking about is AI. Um, there's little doubt that AI has reached a milestone in the last 12 months. Um, and I. I believe that there's some significant gains, uh, not just in the apps that you create uh, going forward, but also how you create them. So we don't have specific items on our roadmap yet for this, but we're thinking a lot about it. 
and uh, we'd love to hear your input. We're going to have an AI panel uh, during the conference. I'm really excited about that. You know, when I was, I don't know, I guess a late teenager, I got really excited about what is now called AI. Back then it was called an expert system. Um, I'd play around with Prolog and Lisp, and I really wanted it to be closer to what it is today. So it only took 30 years, right? It's like fusion. It's always 20 years away, right? So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, AI has definitely come a long way. I'm sure most of you have played around with ChatGPT. It's one of the large language models. There are, going to, there are many others, but it's certainly the most famous. So I'm really interested to see where that goes. And uh, if you've got ideas for how you'd like to, to use uh, AI in your apps, how you think we can help make it better um, for you as a developer, make sure you go and create feature requests. Talk to us about it. Um, we're really excited to see how the world of development and software in general will change over the next several years uh, with AI. Last but not least, um, I love hearing about user projects. Uh, every once in a while, someone contacts us and tells us about something they're doing that's really, really interesting. And I heard about one cool one recently. Uh, this is Michael Smith. Uh, he's a Zojo user. And he's got a channel on YouTube called Nerdtronic. Uh, he focuses on Raspberry Pi, robotics, um, 3D printing, all that geeky kind of stuff. And he decided, <laughs> he decided to build a robot that would reproduce a painting by this guy, Roy Lichtenstein. Now, Roy was famous for doing art that took a lot of inspiration from comic books. Uh, this is a part or a piece of one of them. Uh, again, this is not the whole thing, but this is a piece. This painting sold in 2010 for $42 million, um, which is just amazing. So Michael decided to build this robot. It's a wall-sized robot. You can see this frame around this back wall. And it's got this arm in the middle. And, and uh, this thing is going to basically reproduce a painting. It runs on this track. So you can see this is the arm that's actually doing the, the painting itself. And all the plastic parts here were all 3D printed. He designed this on the computer, 3D printed them to create all of this. And this thing just runs up and down and left and right and reproduces the painting from a program, which he uh, runs on Raspberry Pi and wrote in Zojo, of course. So this is the software he's using behind the scenes to drive the whole operation. Um, there it is running on a Raspberry Pi. Now, he realized pretty quickly, I think, that he potentially could run into a copyright issue by re you know, reproducing a $42 million painting. So instead, I think he was really smart, he decided he would just create a painting of his own in the same style. Uh, he called it one that Roy might have painted if he you know, had continued. And I think he did a really good job. So this is Michael's version of a painting that looks similar to Roy Lichtenstein. I think he did a great job. And here's a, just a few seconds of the video. This is running at high speed. But you can see it just kind of goes along and, and creates the painting one piece at a time. Uh, that was like four times speed. Now, if you want to see the whole thing, it's about a 16-minute video. Just go to YouTube and uh, search for Nerdtronic. You'll find it there. Uh, he, he goes into a lot of detail about how he created the robot, the problems he ran into. Um, you know, it, it's an amazing amount of work. It, it, it looks like, oh, he probably just spent a few weeks and it all got up and running. No, it was like a year-long project to make this work. Uh, but it's, it's, it's fascinating to watch. So despite our willingness to change and adapt, one thing I want to leave you with that is unchanged is our commitment. And that is our commitment to you to continuing to make Zojo the best development tool that we can make it. It's what we love to do. It's our honor to be able to do it day in and day out for all of you. Um, you're the reason we're here. We couldn't do it without you. So uh, we really appreciate that. So I've got some time now for some questions. Um, so if you got one, raise your hand, and uh, we'll get going. Juiced, yeah. Yeah, about uh, libraries. Um, we all remember 
remember on Windows the DLL help. Uh, will it be possible to have different versions of libraries for different projects installed on the same OS? Okay, so the question is, with Zojo Library is a feature we have under development, can you have different versions of a library uh, for different projects? And yet, yeah, the, the, each Zojo library is its own separate file. So you could literally take a set of classes or modules or whatever, uh, compile those to a library, give it a name, and then it's like its own plugin. Think of it that way. So you could have as many of those as you want. They, they can, they're, they can be cross-platform. They can support different project types even. So you might have a single library that supports mobile, desktop, and web, for example. So yeah. Lots of flexibility there. Sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, Paul is reminding me to, to mention Zojo libraries are project specific, meaning that uh, unlike plugins, which are global, right, uh, with Zojo libraries, you drop them into a project to use them. Yeah, so, which is what gives you more version control, right? Because you put this version in and you know that's the version you're using until you switch it for that project. Whereas with plugins being global, the moment you change them, you're changing them for all your projects. Bob? Well, uh, couldn't plugins be made project specific so you drop the plugin or an alias to the plugin in the project folder? Yeah, so, so Bob's question is couldn't we make uh, plugins to be project specific as well? That's actually, it's interesting. You know, there are some features that, that feel like they're very simple and uh, minor change. And it turns out they're actually not. Um, unloading plugins, to not get too into the weeds of the details, but unloading a plugin from memory is, uh, is an issue. So that's one of the reasons that change hasn't been made. Um, it's, it's also nice to have the reverse. Sometimes we're talking about a feature, and I'm convinced it's going to take months and months to build. And then the engineers say, oh, no, 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 that's like a week's worth of work. Uh, so we, we get the opposite, too. But, but unfortunately, with plugins, that's, that's one of those things. But with Zojo libraries, um, you know, you get that benefit of being able to have them be project specific. And for some plugins, it might make sense for them to convert them into Zojo libraries. That would completely be doable if it makes sense for the developer. Oh, great. Thank yeah. you. Other questions? Don't be shy. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the question is, with the, in the code editor with the syntax help area, um, uh, he's getting a lot of method signatures showing up, and you, you want it to not show those at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only when I need it. Yeah. All right, okay. Um, that's an interesting idea. Um, certainly make a feature request. We could potentially look at a way for you just to hide the, um, the syntax help. Now, be specific in your feature request, though, whether you want to hide it universally or you just want it to only show a few or scrollable or, yeah, okay. So yeah, just, just give us the specifics in your feature request and we will absolutely look into that. Anyone else have a, okay, go ahead. Yes, uh, the example, so the, the question is the example projects, can you still download them? You can, uh, if you go to the documentation, you'll, you can find the link to download all the examples. So if, if you know you're going to be offline, uh, like on a long flight, say, overseas, <laughs> uh, it's great to, to have the examples with you in that case. And by the way, even though the documentation is online now, even if you didn't think to download it before, it's actually there. So all you have to do is press a button. It, it, you, you try to access the documentation, and it'll say, hey, you're offline. Do you want to install the local documentation? Press the button, and there it is. It's really great. Yo, you did that. Okay, great. debug thing where you can select or where you can filter your variables. If you are ready with your with your program, you find a bug and and leave the debugger, and then you fix the bug and start over. Everything's gone. Okay. So the question is in the debug filter that we've added. Um, can you, right now, when you exit the debugger, whatever filter you had goes away. And when you start it back up again, it, it's, it's, you know, the, the filter's gone, so you have to enter it again.
Um, yes, we could, we could make it so that that filter is maintained between sessions. Uh, if that's something you're interested in, make a feature request. <laughs> and, if, and for the rest of you, you know, if, if that sounds like a great idea to you, make sure you go into the issue system, find the features that you want to promote, and give those a thumbs up. Because the more, the more data we see, the more users that are interested uh, in a particular issue, whether it's a bug or a feature request, the more energy we're going to focus on that item. Uh, you can comment, you can you know, reply to other users. It, it's a really great system. We're extremely happy with using issues uh, for bug tracking and feature requests. OK, any others? One, you, OK, hang, we'll, we'll come back to you in a second. Juiced, yeah. Yeah, so we, uh, we do. yeah, we actually, so the question, yeah, the question is, um, I think the question is, because that was more of a statement than a question, uh, but I think the question is, you know, are you guys using the Zojo web framework yourselves here at Zojo? Yeah, and, and we absolutely do. Showcase. Yeah, yeah, the show, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, the, right, right, so, so Travis is reminding me, so the, the Zojo showcase is written in Zojo. The Zojo cloud control panel, Right, that you use when you're managing your Zojo cloud, that's all written in Zojo web framework. So we use it quite a bit ourselves as well. Um, the thing about, the, about bug tracking is you know, we want to, like all of you, we want to be as efficient as we possibly can with our time. And the reason that we built bug tracking systems in the past was because there wasn't anything available. Um, the kind of bug tracking system that users who are developers themselves need is different than what the rest of the world of computer users need, right? So uh, in the past, there just wasn't something available that would do the job well enough for developers. And uh, we built our own system. But once something was available, we don't want to keep you know, devoting our time to that. Because we, we have a certain amount of, of time, of engineering time, right? That's why we switched to LLVM. It used to be that you know, we had to maintain both the front end of the compiler and all the back ends, right? Um, we talked for years about optimizing our compiler. And, and we just could never quite get to the point where we had the time to do that. And then LLVM came along. And you know, at first, it was an immature product, but it was promising. And we kept watching it and watching it. And finally, we reached the point where we realized you know what, um, there's really no reason that we shouldn't be using it for the back end. And what we got out of that was it was already an optimizing compiler. So we got a lot of speed advantages. I talked a, a, a few um, events back about one of our users who's a, a physics professor. And he's been building an application that's analyzing data for a, a, pro, a NASA project called the LISA mission, which I talked him recently and it's finally been greenlit. Uh, up all, all these years, it might have not happened. They, they, they have a proposed project, but it doesn't necessarily, th there's a, pro a, pro a process before it's actually given the thumbs up to, to happen. Well, now it's going to happen. It's three satellites that will be orbiting the Earth at a million miles on a side, right? And he told me that when, uh, that for the first 10 years of this project, you know, uh, computer hardware would get better and better, and his code would run faster and faster. And then we added LLVM, and his performance doubled just by opening up his project and pressing compile. So he got 10 years of hardware performance all at once when we went to LLVM. So that was a great, efficient thing. It, it, it was, a, uh, it was an, a big effort for us, but once we completed it, it meant all of you suddenly have an optimizing compiler. So we really try to focus our energy as narrowly as we can so that we get the greatest possible benefit. But Juist, I totally get what you're saying. You know, we, we use Zojo day in and day out. We use the web framework. 
Um, building our own feedback system isn't the only way that we can you know, have that available to us. So we'll, we will keep doing that. Do you have another question, Michael? Okay, so the question is, on Windows, there's uh, often issues, uh, especially with controls, with yeah. flickering and redraw problems. Um, I believe a lot of that is due to the controls being based on Win32. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of that's you know, going to go away with the modern Windows UI. But the person you want to ask is William. William, where are you? He's in the back because you know, he wants to get as far away from that question as he can. Uh, no, but... Uh, but, but Really, uh, talk to William. He, you know, he's going to do a presentation. He'll probably talk about it during his presentation on, uh, on the desktop XAML container. Uh, I'm really excited about the de desktop XAML container. The Windows UI has needed a refresh for a long time. I'm, I'm, I think the, the work that Microsoft has done uh, to modernize it is great, and so it's time for us to bring all that to you. Win32 has been around for a really, really long time. So I'm, I'm really happy with where that's going. So I think you're going to get an opportunity there to really, uh, really refresh your applications for Windows. Any other questions? Christian. Uh, what does the database connection class actually do? Ah, what is, OK. The question is, what does the database connection class actually do? That's a really good question. So um, we're not going to get into all the details of that, because that's just a roadmap item at this point. But uh, it, it's, it, it's a different way to, to manage. When you're building a database app, let, let's start with that. When you're building a database app, um, there's a server potentially that you're connecting to as you're developing your application, right? This is just one thing that this does. Then uh, you might have a server that you use for your beta testing, right? And then you might have yet another one you use for actual production, right? So you could potentially have three different servers. And we've had this happen years and years ago, where we're developing an application for internal use, and um, a developer forgets to you know, point the application at the right server. And suddenly, what we thought was beta data was actually live data. Oops. Yeah. So to avoid that, the database connection class allows you to have multiple servers for a single object that you use to connect to your database. And then when you say, OK, my application's now in beta, it automatically switches to pointing to your uh, beta server. And when you say, OK, now my application's released, it will automatically point to your production server. That's just one of many things that uh, this new class will do. But all of our uh, new database technology that we're going to be building will be based you know, on that foundation of this database connection class. Um, it'll also let you build a row set, by the way. Right now, you can't create your own row set. But with a database connection class, you'll be able to create a row set yourself from your own data, right? rather than just using the, the plugins. So that'll come in the future. We'll, we'll have a lot more to talk about, um, about the database connection class. How many of you build applications that point to a database? OK, yeah. so you can see how important that is. So we'll be doing a lot more work in the future on um, making database applications easier to build. Anything else? OK, well, I appreciate you all coming. Uh, we really look forward to these events, uh, seeing you all in person. You know, it, it's, it's great uh, catching up over the internet, but there's nothing quite like FaceTime and uh, not the technology, but in real life. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So we really look forward to spending these next few days with you, and I hope you really enjoy the conference. Thank you.